Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will act upon it and be doers of it. We thank you for the fruit that will come forth in Jesus' name. Amen. We began sharing with you today on the subject of holiness. We talked about God's covenant of holiness. Every single one of us are to be holy before God. We see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The word be in the Greek is the word genomai, which means to become. For you who are here for the first time, we are able to put the words up here and put, highlight them and you see the Greek word and see the meanings. This word means to become. And it also happens to be an imperative mood verb, which means it's a command. It's not a suggestion. God is commanding you and me to become holy in all manner of conversation. The word conversation doesn't mean just your talk like we would think. It is a word which means manner of life, conduct, and behavior. In everything that you do, God expects you to be holy. He's commanded you to be holy in all things that you and I do. He says, because it's written, be or become holy, for I am holy. He is expecting all of us to become holy. Again, the imperative command. God expects you to enter into holiness in all areas of your life. We talked about the fact that we are spirit, soul, and body. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, Jesus is your sanctification in spirit, you get born again, you have a new spirit that is right with Him. But holiness is more than just being born again. We see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 23, the very God of peace sanctify you holy, talking about the whole person, W-H-O-L-L-Y. I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body, the whole thing is to be sanctified, to be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has called us all unto holiness, spirit, soul, and body. God also declares in the next verse, faithful is he that calleth you. He's called this He's called you with this, who also will do it. That means God has promised to do it. If we will do what he says, he will do it in our life. Remember, we're in covenant relationship with him, and it doesn't happen automatically. It depends on whether or not we yield to him and do the things that he says. You see, in Leviticus chapter 20, in verse 7, he says, Sanctify yourselves, therefore. That means you and I have a part to play in the sanctification process. God doesn't do it without your being available and being obedient and yielded unto Him. And be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. How are you going to do it? What's your part? You shall keep my statutes and do them. God expects you to keep and to do the Word of God. I am the Lord which sanctify you. This is the covenant compound name, Jehovah Kadosh which means the Lord, our sanctification, the one who sanctifies us, the one who brings forth his holiness in our life. God wants us to understand that he is a holy God and he's going to have a holy people. You and I are now the holy nation, the holy people of God, and he wants you to come into everything that he has for you. We see the promise that we saw this morning, look at it again here, it's declared, in Ephesians 1, verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, in the very beginning, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, that we should be, and the word be here is a present tense verb, which means continually we are to be holy and without blame before him in love. That's the way God expects you to walk. You are to walk in holiness all the days of your life and to be without blame before him. That's what he has. That's him, what he thinks, and what he's going to have because he's going to have a church that is going to be holy, without spot, without blemish, unrebukable, unreprovable, that is going to be the remnant who are going to be holy 
before the Lord. We see in Ephesians chapter 2, over in verse 19, he says, Now therefore you're no more strangers. This speaks of someone who was a foreigner to the things of God, didn't have the knowledge of God. And foreigners, which refers to one who doesn't have citizenship. This is a word referring to the fact that they're without citizenship. You and I have citizenship. We're not without citizenship. Where do we have citizenship? In heaven. Because you're born from above. You're a part of the real church. There's only one church, you know, the church of the firstborn. But we are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You are now a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen of the family of God. And are built upon the foundation, the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Remember, we are living stones in the house of God in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. You and I are the temple of the Lord, but combined we all are the holy temple of the Lord. We're to grow into that as we all are being built up and fitly framed together in the body of Christ. See, God's going to have, the body of Christ is going to rise to the full stature of the man in Christ before the days before he comes back. We're going to grow into the holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. See, God is bringing a holy temple forth, and everyone in this is going to be holy. And he's bringing you to the place of being builded together for a habitation of God. God is coming to inhabit you. He's coming to dwell in you. He's coming to walk in you. He's coming to accomplish all the things that he purposes in your life. We have to allow him to have first place and to do what, he has come, what he's told us to do. Well, this means you're to be sanctified spirit, soul, and body. Well, it means you're going to have to make sure that your body is holy before God. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here's, present your body wholly as a living sacrifice unto him. That's what God expects of us. You see, you're bought with a price, and you're to glorify God in your spirit and in your body, which are God's. He bought the whole thing. You belong to him. Even though it's a body of death, it still belongs to him. And you're to glorify him in your body by walking in the spirit and not yielding to the lust of the flesh. So God's expecting us to be holy in body. We also see that we are to be holy in the soul. We see in 1 Peter 1.22, seeing you have purified or made pure and cleansed your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Obedience to the Word will bring forth a purification of your soul. God wants to make your soul pure and holy and clean before the Lord. It all involves obedience. We must be obedient to the truth, which is the Word of God. That's the only way you're going to come to this place. And he's given us commands, and he expects us to follow after the things that he's told us to do. One of the things that we did see is we saw over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. We saw this this morning where it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. When it talks about those are his, it doesn't talk about the ones who've been born again. It's talking about the ones that are really his. Because are is in a present tense, meaning ongoing. Someone who is his and are continuing to be one of his. Why? Because they're walking the walk. They're following him. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The word iniquity is a Greek word, adikia, which means unrighteousness. Unrighteousness. You and I are to depart from unrighteousness if we truly are calling ourselves a Christian. We cannot be calling ourselves a Christian and walking in sin and unrighteousness. That's a Christian in name only. No, you're going to walk the walk, and you're to depart from iniquity, which is unrighteousness. In a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Some to honor, some to dishonor. What determines what kind of a vessel you are? Is it God arbitrarily doing it, as some people teach out there? 
whatever God decides you know. He's in control of all things, so whatever he wants is what's going to be. No, it's a lie. Who's the determining factor? I mean, God's doing the work, but what's going to become to determine whether you are a vessel of honor or a vessel to dishonor? It all depends on what you do. If a man therefore purge, which means to cleanse out thoroughly, God wants you to cleanse out thoroughly everything that is not of him out of your life, out of the soul, and out of the body. If you will purge yourself from these, from what? From the unrighteousness. He shall be a vessel unto honor. So it all depends on whether you do what he says. Sanctify, that produces the sanctification work as you're being cleansed. That's why you've got to go through the cleansing process to holiness. If you don't, you'll never come to the place of being sanctified spirit, soul, and body. And meat for the master's use. You see, it's more than you just getting free of things in your life and being holy yourself. It's because God wants to use you. He wants to use you, and he's preparing you for every good work so you can carry out the ministry of the Lord. God is going to have a holy body that is going to be raised up in these last days. Now, we must not give place to anything that the enemy would bring against us through the flesh, working through the flesh. We know that we have all these lusts that would try to work through the flesh. 1 Peter 2.11, he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Remember, this is the guy who is without, as, as one a stranger and pilgrims, without citizenship, it's talking about in the world, not, we have citizenship in heaven, in the world we don't, and pilgrims, in the fact that you're like a foreigner, it's come from a foreign place, which is from above, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul. There is a battle that goes on. The fleshly lusts will war against your soul, trying to get to your will, your emotion, and your mind. You must not give place to them. You must be ready to crucify the flesh daily. You must deny yourself and make sure that you don't give place to these enemies. You abstain from all fleshly lusts that would try to work against you in your life. And you've got to guard yourself against the enemy. Over in 1 John chapter 5, over in verse 18, it says that he that's begotten of God keepeth himself. God wants you to keep yourself, guard yourself. And what's going to be the result? The wicked one won't be able to touch you. If you'll guard yourself, Satan won't be able to get to you. That means he has to get to you through you yielding to him in some aspect. Open door of sin, walking in the flesh, yielding to him some way. God wants you to guard yourself. And the wicked one will not be able to touch you. He will not be able to get to you in your life. And that's important. We also must walk by faith at all times. Remember, whatsoever is not a faith is sin, it says in Romans 14, 23. So you'll never be able to be walking in sanctification and holiness if you don't walk by faith. And that is important. We see in Luke chapter 1, down in seven, verse 74, he says that he would grant us and be in, ran unto us that we'd be delivered out of the hand of our enemies that we might serve him without fear. Fear and faith are opposites. We're not going to have any fear. We're going to walk in faith, trust, obedience, belief, doing what the word says in holiness and righteousness before him. That's how you're going to walk all the days of our life, not just some. God wants you to walk without fear in holiness and in righteousness before him all the days of your life. That is the call of God for every single one of us, and he will bring that forth in our life if we will do the things that he tells us to do. That means we're, you and I are going to have to be cleansed. We've got to get cleansed from all the filthiness if we're going to be holy before the Lord. Because there is a cleansing process which must take place. We must understand, as we've seen this scripture before, but it's in Job chapter 15 and verse 16, how much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity, which is unrighteousness, that's what this word means, like water, and taken in unrighteousness like water before we're born again. And amazingly, a lot of Christians continue to take it in. We shouldn't be taking it in at all. We've got a lot to get cleansed of. God wants to cleanse out all of the unrighteousness. He wants to purge it all out, everything that is not of the Lord, and to be set free. We see over in Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 12. 
There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. People, if they don't look to God and let God shine his light of his word and bring revelation of what's really in them and be willing to deal with themselves, they'll think they're pure and okay in their own eyes. But no, you've got to be washed from your filthiness before you're going to be pure in the sight of the Lord. God wants us to be washed. We're to be washed from all the filthiness, all the filth, and everything that is of sin is filthy to God. Everything that is of the flesh is filthy. Everything that is of the world is filthy. Everything that is of evil spirits, the, the normal name or the, the common name called throughout the New Testament in the uh, Gospels is unclean spirits, filthy spirits. God wants us to get washed from all of the uncleanness. In Ezra, Ezra chapter 9, over in verse 11, Ezra 9, verse 11, he says, Which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land unto which you go to possess it is an unclean land, with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. So what did they have to do? They had to drive all the enemies out, didn't they, in order to go and possess the land. Well, the physical in the Old Testament is a type of the spiritual in the New Testament. The land is the type of the spiritual land, which is the promises of God that you and I are to possess. And you and I have come into the land in a measure when we've been born again. But you and I now are to go and possess all that God wants for us and see those promises come to pass in our life. But what do we find? We've got a lot of uncleanness in us. We've got a lot of filthiness. The filthiness of the people speaks of the evil spirits and all the effects of what the enemy has done to bring filth in our life. All the filth has to be driven out. And remember, when they went to possess the land, they had to go against every enemy. And God said, drive them out. Don't leave any remain. Clean house on the whole deal. We must drive out. This is the demons and the effects of demons and sin in our life. God wants us to cast these spirits out and to get set free so that we can be holy vessels before the Lord and be cleansed. We've got to be cleansed of all the filthiness. Ezekiel chapter 36 down in verse 17. He said, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. That shows you. But how, what's one of the ways we get defiled? By doing our own way instead of walking in his way. You, you do anything that is of your own way that's of the flesh, it's defiling. You can only walk in his way. That's why Jesus said, If any man will come after me, what's the first thing? Deny himself. Crucify the flesh daily. You must deny yourself. They defiled it by their own way and by their, their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman, he says. He says, wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they'd shed upon the land, for their idols where they'd polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen. They were dispersed through the countries according to the way and according to their doings. Their way and their doings, I judged them. God will judge us according to our way and our doings as well. He knows us by our fruit. All of your works are born some kind of fruit, whether it's good or bad. And judgment comes, of course, because of the things that we have done. Therefore, you and I must turn away from walking in our own way. We cannot walk after our own way. We cannot do the things that we want to do. We are to be yielded vessels unto the Lord and live unto him. Remember, you are bought with a price. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 15, he died for all, that they which live, which is every born-again person that's been born again, we're talking about, and the people that aren't born again, they don't have life yet. This is the born-again people, should not henceforth live unto themselves. You can't live unto yourself, or you're not following the Lord. But unto him which died for them and rose again, God expects you to live unto the Lord. In fact, you've got to realize you cannot walk in your own way. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2. Look at the statement he makes. I've spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. What was wrong with them? These guys, it says they were rebellious. Why were they rebellious? 
which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Not only, you can't make your own way, you've got to watch your thoughts. If you've got these thoughts coming into you that are your own thoughts, and you don't replace them with the Word of God and bring them captive, then you're going to, that's going to affect you in the way you walk, and it'll be a way that's not good. He says those people are rebellious. God does not want you to walk after your own thoughts in a way that you want to walk. He wants you to walk after the way of the Word. Put the Word of God first place in your life and take every thought captive and think on what the Word says that you should be doing. That is what He expects for us in our life. Over in Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. He speaks of the one who's filthy and polluted. Woe to her that's filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. God wants to get rid of all filthiness and pollution out of us. How did they get that way? He begins to tell you. She obeyed not the voice. Disobedience to the voice of the Lord pollutes you. It causes you to be filthy. She received not correction. Don't correct me. I'll do whatever I want to do. If you're not correctable, you're going to be filthy and you're going to be polluted. She trusted not in the Lord. She just did, did her own thing. Didn't trust in the Lord. Maybe gotten worry, fear, anxiety. That's still a sin. God wants you to trust in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. She didn't draw nigh to Him. Remember, if you draw nigh to Him, He'll draw nigh to you. And that's how He's going to work His sanctification in your life. Her princes within her are roaring lions, and her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bone, no, gnaw not the bones till the morrow. All kinds of destructive things were affecting them from what was around them. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. You know, they weren't telling them the truth. That's why you better judge everything that anybody tells you in line with the word. There's a lot of self-made prophets out there that say all kinds of stuff. You better be sure they're giving you the word of God. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They've done violence to the law. We're not going to pollute this sanctuary because we're only going to do things that are in line with the word. We're not going to have any things of the world. We're not going to have anything that's profane whatsoever. They've done violence to the law because they haven't followed it. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. Otherwise, they wouldn't repent. They continued to do it. They didn't know any shame. They began to harden their heart. They just continued to do it. On and on and on. What a mistake. I've cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I've made their streets waste, that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed, so that there's no man, that there's none inhabited. God got fed up with them to the point where his judgment came upon them because they would not walk in the ways of the Lord. He said, surely thou shalt will fear me. Well, they wouldn't fear him. If you have the fear of God, you'll depart from iniquity. Thou wilt, re thou wilt receive instruction. He thought, surely they'll receive my instruction, correction, the things I want to bring forth, so their dwelling should not be cut off. But they wouldn't listen. You see, we've got to learn to listen to what God tells us to do. We can't continue to repeat the same mistakes and the same things over and over and over and over and over. Howsoever, I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. I mean, these guys were walking wrong. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, on the day that I rise up into the prey for my determinations to gather the nations, that I might assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even my, all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. That's what's going to happen on the nations that continually reject him, and they are going to be in trouble. For then will I turn to the people of pure language, that they all may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. That's what God wants. The ones who are walking the walk are going to call upon the Lord. They're going to serve Him. They're going to do the things that God says. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings. There should be a shame for all the sinful things. Wherein thou hast transgressed against me. Otherwise there must be a godly sorrow that works real repentance in our life. For then I will take away out of the midst of them the, them that rejoice in thy pride. Thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. Pride and God don't mix, that's for sure. Humility is mandatory. All the proud will be brought low. 
I also leave in the midst of the afflicted and poor people that shall trust. They shall trust in the name of the Lord. And the remnant of Israel, because there is going to be a remnant is going to rise up in these last days, shall not do iniquity. They shall not do unrighteousness, this means, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. This is the one that's going to be holy. But they shall feed on the word of God and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. You're going to feed on the word of God so you get strengthened. You walk in the ways of the Lord all the days of your life. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart of daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He's going to do that too. How's he going to take away all of our judgments that have come upon us from sin? And we got a boatload from inheritance, our own sins and victimization. It's through deliverance. He has cast out thine enemy. The demons have to be cast out. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. That's right. You've got to let his rule come into your life. Because when God, you let God have his way, and he comes in to begin to drive out the enemies, and also bring you to the place of repentance that you'll walk in the way of the Lord, God's rule and reign will come into your life. You want his rule and reign coming into your life because he will deal with everything and he will smite every enemy and he will bring forth his word and his promises in your life because he wants to bless you. He wants to bring you, raise you up to be strong in him and walk in victory. And notice the great promise, thou shalt not see evil anymore. If we'll just let him be Lord, let him be Lord of all, you're going to come to the place of being delivered and healed and set free and you will not see evil evil any more. Uncleanness, filthiness has to be eliminated out of our life. In Romans chapter 1 verse 21 we see how these guys got to this place where they were in a mess. It says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, these guys knew God at one point, they glorified Him not as God. That means you've got to give glory and honor to the Lord. You can't just take Him for granted or just ignore him, or try to make him a push button God when I need a problem, when I have a need of prayer answered for my problem. No, you've got to glorify him as God. Neither were they thankful. You need to be thankful unto the Lord, thankful for all he's done, what he is doing, and what he's going to do. Thank him continually, and praise him, and worship him. They became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. If you don't glorify God and give thanks to him, you're going to have a foolish heart, and it's going to be darkened before the Lord. Oh, they professed themselves to be wise, but they became fools because they didn't walk in the way of the Lord. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, the birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. They were out of their minds, weren't they? Yeah. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, uncleanness, all this uncleanness. God will let you choose your way. He gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between them. Terrible. Look what they did. They changed the truth of God into a lie. Don't change the truth of God into a lie to try to fit what you want to do. No. Do not ignore scriptures. God's word is the truth. We don't change the truth of God into a lie. And they also worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Ah, who are they serving now? Who are they really walking after? Themself instead of the creator who's blessed forever. You change the truth of God into a lie, and you start believing lies, and you start serving yourself and worshiping yourself by doing what you want to do, this cause God gave them up to vile affections, even their women to change the natural use of that which is against nature. This is how these people became homosexuals. Likewise, men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, receiving themselves the recompense of their error that was meat. Homosexuality comes to these ones that reject the way of the Lord even as they did not like to retain or to have, this really means to have, God in their knowledge or hold God in their knowledge. They didn't want to hear anything about God. They just shoved him away. You don't shove God away and think that you're not going to have some judgments that are going to come. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, an unapproved mind, to do things that are not convenient. And now they're walking in all this uncleanness, all this evil, filled with unrighteousness and fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, 
without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but it will bring curses upon us and destruction. They get, God gives them to uncleanness if they do not walk in the ways of the Lord. That means you and I better be sure that we're yielding ourselves to God. We see in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Know ye not to whom, that's a person, you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. In the measure that you're obedient is what it produced righteousness in your life. If you've been yielding to sin, it's produced death in some capacity. God wants us to yield ourselves to be obedient to God. Verse 19, he speaks, As you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness, all this uncleanness brought this filthiness into us, and to lawlessness that produces more lawlessness in our life. That's what this word means. Even so, that's what we used to do. We're not doing that anymore. Even so, now yield your members, all your faculties, servants to righteousness, to do what is right in God's sight. That's why you don't do what you want to do. You do what God says. What's that going to produce? Unto holiness. So if you're going to produce holiness, it's going to be because you're going to be obedient to the word that produces righteousness, fruits of righteousness, that will bring forth holiness in your life. God is going to have a holy people. That means we can't be yielding ourselves to anything that's unclean or we're going to have all this filthiness. We've got to clean up those areas. We also have to be sure that we purge out everything that's not of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. This is the case, by the way, where it speaks of the man who was involved in fornication, and this was what such even that wasn't named among the Gentiles or the nations, that one should have his father's wife. That's incest. Incestual activity was going on. They knew it, and they weren't doing anything about it. They're puffed up, not rather mourned that he has done this deed might be taken among you, away from you. You can't allow that in the church. No, that person's got to be called to repentance and dealt with. And if they won't come to repentance, God always gives people space to repent. Then they have to be removed. For verily I am absent in the body, but present spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're gathered together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Otherwise, you send him outside of the church, now that's delivering him outside of, uh, unto Satan because they had to throw him out of the church because he wasn't walking right and he would not repent that the Spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. It wasn't automatic. People think, oh, that meant he was still saved? No. It's in the subjunctive mood. And the way you would translate this is might be saved. Because the subjunctive mood means something that's conditional upon conditions being met. Meaning he could be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus if he met the conditions, which were what? Confesses sin, repent, turn, of course, away from all the ways of sin and get, get himself right with the Lord. Well, he goes on, he says, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, leaven's a type of sin, leaveneth the whole lump. It contaminates the whole group. That's why you cannot allow sin to go on in the church. It's amazing how many pastors today allow sin to go on the church in the church that they know of. You cannot allow that. You call the person to repentance and encourage them to do the right thing. You cannot allow sin to go on in the church. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. He says, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you're unleavened. Leaven's a type of sin. Unleavened is one that's holy and not sinful. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And he goes on down here, and in verse 9 he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, not to be intimate and have mixing company where you're fellowshipping with fornicators. Can't have that happening. Remember, that's going to bring a negative effect upon you. Filthiness will come into you. 
Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world, otherwise judgments are going to come on you. But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man be called a brother or be a fornicator, not only anybody that's unsaved, but anybody that's a brother, if they're a fornicator or covetous or idolater or railer or drunkard or extortioner, you don't even eat with that one. That's what the Word says. You don't have fellowship with that one or it's going to contaminate you. That's important. What have I to do to judge them also without? Do you not judge them within? The church is supposed to judge those who are within in order that we walk in the ways of the Lord. God wants all sin out a lot of our life. If a little leaven leavens the whole lump, what's it going to do in you? A little sin will contaminate you. Remember when they lost their battles? And back in Joshua chapter 7, Achan had sinned. And he says, Israel has sinned. That's why they couldn't stand against their enemies. We saw that scripture this morning. He couldn't stand against the enemies because he had sin. He had to deal with the sin and get it out and be sanctified. Otherwise, they could not stand against their enemies. Can you and I stand against our enemies if we have sin in areas of our life? No. We're kidding ourselves. We're not going to be able to stand. God wants us to deal with this all. Well, he came to correct these guys. They had a lot of problems with fornication at the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians, now he writes a second letter to these guys, and he comes down in chapter 12, verse 21. He says, Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and the fornication and the lasciviousness which they've committed. They didn't want to stop. Uh, judgment's going to come. God, remember, gives us repentance. It gives us space, a space of time to repent, but they wouldn't listen. These guys did not repent of their uncleanness. God wants you to make a decision. I am turning away from all uncleanness in my life. Everything that is not of God, I have nothing to do with it. I'm going to root it out of my life. I'm going to get rid of it. I will not allow myself to walk after anything that is unclean in the sight of the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 10, chiefly it speaks of those who walk after the flesh. Remember, the flesh is something you have, but it's a way of life you can walk after if you don't walk in line with the Word. Walking after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, being defiled. And these guys also despised, which meant they thought little of anybody's government or lordship over them. They didn't think anything about Jesus being Lord at all. They thought little about that. They didn't want him to be Lord. They wanted to run their own life. A lot of people just want to run their own life. No, that doesn't work. Jesus is Lord. You're either under Satan's dominion or you're under Jesus. You're not, there's no middle ground. We're not running our own show. These guys were walking after the flesh, continuing the lust of uncleanness, and they despised anybody ruling or didn't thought little of anybody ruling or reigning over them. See, when you let all this filthiness come in from all these areas of sin, the enemy is going to really work against you. Look what it says in Lamentations 1.7. Jerusalem remembered in the days of her affliction, of her miseries, had all, had all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old, when her people fell into the hand of the enemy and none did help her. The adversary saw her and did mock at her Sabbath. The enemy began to come against them. And it says that in verse 8, that Jerusalem had grievously sinned. They sinned continually. Her filthiness is in her skirt. She remembered not her last end. Therefore she came down wonderfully. She had no comforter. The O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy magnified himself. You give place, the enemy will magnify himself in your life. You give him an inch, he'll take a foot. You give him a little, little bit, he'll take a yard, and then he'll take more and more, and he will magnify himself in your life whenever you yield to him. You're walking, you're walk, trying to walk the walk, and you're doing the word, and you're doing pretty good, and then all of a sudden you kind of get off track for a minute. I'll tell you, he will rise up big time. He will magnify himself if you walk in sin and give place to him in your life. God does not want that. All her people sigh. They seek bread. They've given their pleasant things for me to relieve the soul. See, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. They were absolutely vile, and the enemy had taken over and had manifested himself. 
For these things I weep, mine eye, mine eyes run down with water, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. And now they were in a mess. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. Is the enemy to prevail over us? No. All the filthiness has how the enemy came in. That's evidence of the enemy. It's come into our life. What does God want? He wants us to get set free. He wants us to get cleansed. You're to be cleansed of all filthiness in your life. Genesis 35, verse 1. God said to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel. What's Bethel mean? House of God. God wants you to come to church, to hear the word of God, to praise and worship God with all of your might, all of your strength, minister unto him. He wants you to hear the word of God, be ready to take hold of the word, do what the word says, get yourself mind renewed, get delivered, get set free, do the things that God wants. And he says, dwell there. That's where you need to be. Make there an altar unto God. You're going to worship him that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And Jacob said unto his household, to all that are with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you. Get rid of all these things that are not of the Lord. Anything that becomes a source other than the Lord. Get rid of it all. Be clean and change your garments. That means we've got to change things that we've been putting on in our life. We can't allow anything evil to come into our life any longer. Be clean and change your garments to put on the things that God wants us to put on in our life. And God wants to deal with everything in our life. In Psalms 19, verse 12, he says this, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Those are the things that nobody knows but just you alone. He even talks about, I was talking about his word back here, about how the statutes of the Lord, if we go back here, how the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, how it's sure, making wise the simple, and how the right rejoice in the heart, how the commandments pure, enlightening the eyes, how the fear of the Lord is clean, because we need the fear of the Lord if we're going to get ourselves cleansed from all the filthiness. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. He is just. There are more to be desired today than gold, than fine gold, much more sweeter than honey or honeycomb. And that's when he says, By them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them is great reward. Who can understand his heirs? Cleanse thou me from my secret faults. God wants to cleanse you from everything that only you know and God doesn't know. Or other people don't know, but God knows. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent of the great transgression. God wants you to get cleansed from all the things that are hidden. Everything. All the attitudes that we have. They all need to be dealt with. See, God wants you to have a pure heart before him. A pure heart. A heart that's totally yielded unto the Lord. Psalms 119, verse 9. Well, how are we going to do this? Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? How are you going to cleanse your way? How are you going to get cleansed from all this filthiness? By taking heed there unto, thereto according to thy word. Whatever the word says, you do it. You do whatever his, the word says. It is going to work to bring a cleansing in your life in all areas as you deal with every situation. God wants you to get this word in you. We see in James chapter 1, down in verse 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness, all this filthiness, get rid of it, and superfluity of naughtiness. Receive with meekness the engrafted word. Engrafted means the implanted word. God's taking his word and planting it in you, which is able to save your souls. It's going to save and deliver your soul from all this evil. The word of God is going to deal with you and get rid of all this. And you need to get the word in you and go through the cleansing process and bring forth fruit. John chapter 15. I'm the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me, that's what you and I are branches, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Why would we not bear fruit? Because we're not doing the word, we're not hearing and doing the word. The word is what produces the fruit in our life. Every branch that beareth fruit, you begin to do it. Well, that's just the beginning. He purgeth it, he cleanses it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Otherwise, God wants to be able to bring forth more fruit, 
and you've got to go through the purging process. That it may, present tense, continually be bringing forth more fruit, but it happens to be a subjunctive mood, which means it's conditional. It's not automatic that you're going to bring forth more fruit. It depends on whether you go through the purging process. Mm -hmm. If you go through the purging, cl cleansing process, you'll bring forth more fruit. Mm -hmm. Most Christians that have not, gone through the cr have not gone through the cleansing process, so they have fruit, little fruit, and that's it. They'll never get to the place of bringing forth more fruit in their life until they go through the purging, cleansing process. That's why if people don't talk about sin and repentance and casting out and, and crucifying the flesh and dealing with all these areas, they'll never get anywhere for bringing forth more fruit in their life. God wants us. And so as you're acting on the Word and doing what He says, then He gives them the results. Now you are clean through the Word that I've spoken unto you because they acted on the Word that was spoken and they saw the cleansing come forth in their life. The purging process came. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except that it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. You've got to stay hooked into the vine, which is going to be through you hearing and doing the word. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. How do you get to the place of abiding? Abiding means you're living, remaining, dwelling. This is the way you live. This is your lifestyle. This is the way you act on everything. You do the word continuously. It's you continue in it. That's the person who's come to the place of abiding. And that's the only way you're going to come to the place of producing much fruit because you continue in the word of God in doing the things he says. He says, if a man abide not in me, that means he's not continually doing it. He's cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them in the fire and they're burned. Well, you're in trouble. God expects us to come to this abiding place and walk in the ways of the Word of God. That means we've got to get all this filthy stuff out of us. All filthiness has to be eliminated. We'll look at a scripture that we looked at this morning, which I think is a very important scripture for the body of Christ in these days. I'll repeat it again tonight. 2 Chronicles 29, in verse 5, he says, said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites. The Levites were the priests. Who are the priests today? all born-again Christians. So he could be saying from today's standpoint, hear me, all believers in Jesus Christ. Sanctify now yourselves. It's our responsibility to do it. And sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, which is you and also the place where we're gathering together hearing the word of God. And carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. The Old Testament had three parts to the temple the Holy of Holies, the holy place, and the outer court. The holy place was the place where we're supposed to carry this filth out of. Well, the Holy of Holies is likened to our spirit where God dwells in us. The holy place likened to our soul. The outer court likened to our physical body. So the holy place speaks of the soulish area. God wants to carry forth all the filthiness out of your soul. Anger, it's filthiness, put it away. Bitterness, resentments, Unforgiveness, put it away. God wants it all eliminated. All the things, disobedience, rebellion, all this worry, anxiety, stubbornness, you know, all these things you could go on a list, affects you in your mind, your will, your emotions, negativism. He wants it all out. Every bit of filthiness is to be driven out of our mind, out of our emotions, out of our, affecting our will. He wants us to get rid of all this filthiness. Verse 15, they gathered their brethren. We're gathered here together today, the brethren. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And they sanctified themselves. They did what God said. They came and according to the commandment of the king by the word of the Lord. What's the commandment of the king today? Same thing, by the word of the Lord. Cleanse yourselves, sanctify yourselves. Get rid, get cleansed of all this filthiness in your life. To cleanse the house of the Lord. The priests, that's you and me, went into the inner part of the house of the Lord. That meant they went inside to cleanse it, brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord. That meant they went looking for it. Some people say, well, it sounds like you're going to look for all this evil, including evil spirits in you. You're right. We want to find out everything that's in us. Any areas of sin, we want it out. Any areas of uh, you know, unfleshly things, anything of the world that's got a hold of us, we want to get it out. 
any evil spirits that are in us from inheritance, our own sins, or victimization, we want to discover them all. We want to get them all out. They, all the, the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord, in the court of the, of the house of the Lord, they took it and carried it out, brought it to the brook Kidron, got rid of it. God wants you to carry out everything that is evil out of your life. Now they began the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord, so they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. Eight days means it took a period of time. It will be a process for you to be sanctified and to drive out all the filthiness out of your life in all areas, including all these evil spirits that have come in from inheritance, our own sins, and victimization. And notice it took them eight days. Eight is significant because the number eight is the number of new beginnings, which means once it's accomplished, it'll be like a new beginning in your life. Just think, if you had had nothing, of the, the, all the fleshly works were put underfoot. You were healed and delivered of all these things in the soulish realm. You have cast all these demons out, and they're eliminated out of your life. And you're now abiding in the things of God, bringing forth fruit. What's it going to be like? It's going to be like a new beginning in your life. You're going to flourish in the things of God. That's why we need to get delivered, and we need to deal with every area of filthiness in our life. All of the filthiness is to be brought out of our life. We've got to discover everything. We've got to go look for it, find out what all's there. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 14 says, Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, for they have not discovered thine iniquity. They didn't discover this evil things in their life. To turn away thy captivity. That means if they would have discovered the iniquity, they could have turned the captivity. If we don't discover the problem areas, we won't be able to turn the captivity. That's why, especially in the area of deliverance, it's good to discover everything that's in you. See, one of the reasons we may, I made those cast-out CDs was not only to help people to be able to cast out so that they could use it daily to command the demons to come out, but also for you to be able to discover what all is in you. Maybe you have inherited witchcraft. You have no earthly idea what all could be in you. And you use that inherited witchcraft cast-out session, and, you might, and there's all kinds of spirits that are listed in there of all kinds of things, and you might have all kinds of spirits coming out, and you had no earthly idea that you had it in you. See, you can discover, there's one way, you can discover a lot of what's in you. We need to discover all the iniquity roots so we can turn all the captivity and get free and get all this filthiness out of our life. That's what God wants and to bring forth for you and me. We see over in Isaiah, chapter 4, verse 4. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, that's what we want, get that filth washed away, shall purge the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment, the spirit of burning. Everything's got to be everything's got to be eliminated and burn up, eliminated out of our life. That's what God wants. The Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and Zion's a picture of the conquering church, and upon her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day. That's the presence of God. The shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. That's the glory of God manifest. We've talked about the glory of God's coming to the church. It's going to come to the church that's come to the place of without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, holy, unrebukable, unreprovable before the Lord, that has come to the place that has been washed away from all the filth. It says this glory shall be a defense. There shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and a place of refuge and a, for a covert or a place of shelter, that means, from storm and from rain. That means you'll be protected from any and all attacks it, when you get this all out and you walk in the ways of the Lord. You can walk in the place of victory. Just like it said, no evil shall befall you any longer. That's where God wants us to bring, bring us to. He's going to ask to wash away all the filthiness first out of us. Isaiah 52, verse 1. He says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. It's your responsibility and my responsibility to put on the strength of the Lord through the Word of God in us. Put on thy beautiful garments. 
God's word is like putting on garments, clothes on you, the garment of praise, the robe of righteousness, all the parts of the armor of God. Everything that you're putting on of the word is like putting on spiritual clothes or garments upon you. Put on those beautiful garments, everything that's of the Lord, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto the uncircumcised and the unclean. Set the boundary, no more that's not, that's not of the Lord, no more that's unclean is coming into me. Set the boundary. Set your mark. Set it. That's the way it's going to be. No more. I'm done with allowing any of that stuff to come into me any longer. Verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go you out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't listen to it. Don't see it. Don't be around it. You're going to witness to people. It doesn't mean you're going to be around people in the world that have full of it. You're going to be witnessing it. We're talking about you partaking of it yourself. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. You and I are the vessels of the Lord. The presence of God coming in us. Can the presence of God manifest if we have a bunch of uncleanness stuff? No, it's going to shut it down in our life. No wonder Christians don't see the manifestation of the presence of the Lord. They've got all this filthy stuff in them. If you get the filthiness out and quit touching the unclean thing, be clean, you're bearing the vessel of the Lord. He, the reason he doesn't manifest is because he can't manifest until you get this stuff out. He wants you to get delivered. So you are the vessel of the Lord so he can manifest his glory, the presence of God in your life. Ezekiel 22, verse 14. Can thine heart endure? Can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. Otherwise, he's wanting to, you've got to deal with things here. I'll scatter thee among the heathen and disperse thee in the countries and will consume thy filthiness out of thee. Otherwise, God wants to get this filthiness out. They're going to be scattered. These guys wouldn't listen to him. Will consume thy filthiness out of thee. All the uncleanness is to come out. That's what he purposes for every single one of us if we'll allow him to accomplish his work in our life. In Ezekiel chapter 36 in verse 25, he says, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. That's the word of God, type of the word of God. It's going to bring a cleansing. From all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. God will get rid of everything out of your life. You just have to let him have his way. You've got to put the word of God first place and be a doer of that word. People that aren't people of the word, they're not going to go anywhere. There's a lot of people that aren't people of the Word. Well, they may want certain things from God, but they're not really people of the Word. You're to be a person who's a people of the Word. We're people of the Word. We want the Word on everything. We want to walk after the way of the Word of God. We want to be cleansed from everything. We're going to get rid of all this filthiness and everything out of our life, which necessitates we're going to have to walk in the Spirit. You certainly can't walk in the flesh and think that you're not going to have uncleanness in you. It's not going to happen. Galatians 5, 16. And this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. How do we do that? According to the Word. The capital letters are not in the Greek. There aren't any capitals. It, sh it, could, it should be S, small little S for Spirit. We walk in the Spirit according to our Spirit instead of walking according to the flesh. There's a way of the Spirit. There's a way of the flesh. How do you walk in the Spirit? According to the Word of God. And then you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. It's talking about what's in you. They're warring against each other. These are contrary, the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. Your spirit's ready to do right. Remember, your spirit's always ready and willing. Your flesh is weak, doesn't want to do anything. When it talks about watching and praying. You can never listen to your flesh. You cannot hearken to your flesh. It will always lead you down a path of, against the ways of the spirit. He goes on and says, the works of the flesh are these. And he starts listing them out. Adultery and fornication, uncleanness, all kinds of uncleanness, lasciviousness, all this evil. If you have the works of the flesh, you've got uncleanness. That's why we've got to root this out. You've got to put a stop to this. You can't be given place to this in your life. You've got to put this underfoot. It's going to bring destruction upon you. 
idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've told you in the past, they which do these such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty serious business. You can't be doing that stuff. No inheritance of the kingdom of God if you walk in this stuff. Uncleanness. It's all got to be eliminated out of our life. Ephesians 5. Verse 3. Fornication. All uncleanness. All of it. Or covetousness, let it be not be once named among you as become a saint. If we've committed it in the past, I trust that you've confessed your sin, you've received forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness, you have godly sorrow that's worked true repentance in your life, and you're setting the boundary. No more. No more will I cross that boundary and touch the unclean thing. We must not allow those things to happen. Neither filthiness, it means obscenity. God doesn't want any obscene swearing or cussing or any of that stuff coming out of your mouth, obscenities. No. Nor foolish talking, just babbling on all these kind of things. The Bible says our words to be few. Nor jesting. Should we be jesting and joking in all these things which are not convenient? No, we don't. he didn't want us to be the jesting, the humor, the facetious ones, whether it's low jesting or whether it's just pleasantry, all that kind of stuff. It's amazing how so many pastors today give all these little jokes. In fact, I've seen pastors where they say, well, we're getting ready to start our service today. I got a joke to tell you first, everybody, you know, before they even start. And they think the anointing of God's going to be there and God's going to do anything. I don't think so. Joking? All this little stuff, this is not of the Lord. It's all of the flesh. It's not of God whatsoever. He says, get rid of all this stuff. He wants it eliminated. For this you know that no whoremonger, that's a, again, one who's a fornicator, pornos, nor unclean person. That's quite a statement. Look at what this says. An unclean state person is not cleansed. A person is not cleansed. A covetous or idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You've got to get cleansed. We've got to get cleansed. That's why you sin. You confess your sin now. Receive your forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness now. Get a godly sorrow that works repentance. Get the word before you. Set the boundaries no more. You're not going to have any more of that uncleanness coming in. God wants you to have a hatred for sin and strive against sin, as it says in Hebrews 12.4. Have you yet to see anybody striving against sin with drops of blood coming off of them because they're striving against it so much? You can strive against sin. Don't be a pushover for sin. You can stop it in your life because sin has no dominion over you, remember. He has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. That's the millennial age. And of God, that's in eternity. That means no ruling and reigning for you, period, if you walk in these kind of things. High price to pay for a little pleasure for a few moments. Pleasure is a sin for a season, but it will end up bringing great destruction on a person in their life. We cannot allow this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. God wants you cleansed of all filthiness. Mortify, put to death, therefore your members that are upon the earth. Fornication, I put you to death in the name of Jesus. Uncleanness, I put you to death in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to give place to you. In order to affection, Evil concupiscence, evil longings and cravings, it's all a lust of the flesh. Take your thoughts captive. Don't get place of that stuff in the imaginations in your mind. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Put it all to death. He wants it all eliminated. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. God has not called us unto uncleanness. He's called us to be holy. He said, he commanded us, become holy as I am holy. How can we have uncleanness in us? All uncleanness is the opposite of, unholy, of, of holiness. It's like having being unholy. God wants you to walk in holiness. No uncleanness in your life. It is all to be eliminated. James chapter 4, verse 8. We've got to deal with all the sin in our life. Draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Get that, all that stuff off of you. It's contaminating you. Purify your hearts, you double-minded, or two-souled, this means. Double-minded, one is die sucos, two-souled. Get yourself set. You need to excel in taking your thoughts captive and governing your mind and making sure your will is choosing the things that God wants and you don't let those emotions come in and those thoughts come in and take you and begin to lead you down a negative path. Guard yourself. Guard yourself. Remember, whosoever guards himself, the wicked one touches him not. He can't get to you if you'll guard yourself. Well, God expects us to do all these things. All these evil spirits. What's, the, again, the general name for all the evil spirits? Some 20 times in the Gospels. They're called unclean spirits. Unclean spirits. They've come in from sin. Everybody's sin. Everybody has demons in them. Everybody needs to cast them out. They've come in from sin, from inheritance, from three, four generations. They've come in from own, own sins and victimization in life. Everybody needs deliverance, and they need a lot of deliverance to drive everything out in order to be set free. These people that say, well, we're just going to cast out once and all be gone, and leave them, leave them all free. Well, I don't have much in me at all. I might have a couple more left. They don't know what they're talking about. They are out in Lulu land. They are in denial. They do not understand things yet. Some of them are sincere, but they're off. Every one of us has a network of spirits. There's a lot to drive out. Unclean spirits, they all have to be driven out of our life. God wants you to come to the place of being holy. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. That means it's your and my responsibility to do it. From what? All, not some, all filthiness, all this uncleanness stuff, of what? Of the flesh, every fleshly thing, and spirit. What would the filthiness of the spirit be? It's not talking about your spirit, because your spirit is where the spirit of Jesus Christ is, and you receive the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. What's the filthiness of the spirit? Evil spirits that are in the soul and in the body. They're the filthy, unclean spirits that you have to cast out. That's how you cleanse yourself from the filthiness of the spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That tells you. God wants us to perfect holiness in the fear of God. He wants you to be holy, spirit, soul, and body. He wants you to come to that place of being one who's so holy that the glory of God will be poured out upon you. Perfecting holiness. That shows you. Until a person comes to the place of getting serious and cleansing themselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and casting out all the demons, they will never perfect holiness in the fear of God. And they're in trouble. God wants us to do the things that he says and be obedient. Everything needs to be dealt with in our life. That's why when people say, how long am I going to have to cast out these demons after one session? Well, you just got started, and we're just going to keep on doing it day after day after day. God's going to bring everything up to come out, and uh, don't even think about how long. Just do it every day and watch what happens. And who knows how long you might do it. You might be doing it weeks, months, years. It's okay. You just cast them all out until you clean house. Every one of us got a lot in us. Everybody wants to get free now, you know. We will get free, but, you know, we got to do what we got to do. Well, where, where's the type of that? In the Bible, in the Old Testament. What did they have to do? Go into every city, cast them all out, don't leave any remain. Next city, cast them all out, don't leave any remain. Next city, Cast them out, don't leave any remain. See, we've got to go after everything and drive them all out. If we leave any remain, well, I wonder why the Lord allowed that. Nah, and you can't pull that one on God. That one won't work. We are supposed to drive them all out. Numbers 33, 52. You shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you. All means all. You'll dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I've given you the land to possess it. And then he says in verse 55, a very important statement. If you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, which is a type of you casting out all the evil spirits from out of you, it'll come to pass that those which you let remain of them. You can't blame it on God. You can't blame it on the devil, because God's given you authority over the devil. You have to look and say, 
I let them remain, because I did not cast them out. Oh, you let them in, they're going to be pricks in your eyes, thorns in your sides, and they will vex you in the land where you dwell. They will work you over in your mind, your emotions, your thoughts, your will, your body, all situations, draw negative things at you left and right, all kinds of stuff. Because the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's why we all got to get involved in deliverance and clean house on everything. Everything is to be dealt with in our life. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 3. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, stood before the angel. Well, we've got to get rid of that. He answered and spake unto those that stood before him, and say, Take away the filthy garments from him. Behold, I've caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. That's what God wants. All the filthy things have to be taken off. We're going to put off all the old man, everything that's not of God. We're going to put on the new man. We're going to put on the Word of God. We're going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to put off everything that's not of God, put off the anger, the bitterness, the resentment, the clamor, the evil speaking, all that stuff. We're putting on everything that's of the Lord. We're putting on the humility. We're putting on the long-suffering. We're putting on the love. We saw that list of all those things in Colossians. We put all these things on, humbleness of mind. We're going to put on all these things, put on the armor of God, putting on spiritual clothes. Everything God wants you to clothe yourself with is important because you're going to get a change of raiment. You're going to be a different person. You're going to be like Jesus. Because it says you put on the Lord Jesus Christ is what you're doing. You've got to realize when you're getting the Word in you, whether you realize it or not, as it says in Romans chapter 13, over here in verse 14, you are putting on the Lord Jesus Christ in you. Put on, which is to clothe yourself. And you're not going to make any forethought or provision for the flesh to fulfill the loss thereof. Every bit of it is going to be eliminated. That's of the flesh and everything that's of the Lord is going to be put on. God wants you to get yourself cleansed from all filthiness, every bit of it in your life. Job 17, verse 9, look what he says. The righteous shall hold or seize and take possession on his way. You're going to grab hold of the way of the Lord and you're, that's the way you're going to walk. You're not going to bow or turn away from it ever. And he that has clean hands, the guy that's been cleansed, he's going to get stronger and stronger. Your level of spiritual strength is not going to be any more than the level of the cleansing that has occurred in your life. Little cleansing, little spiritual strength. You get clean, you're going to get stronger and stronger in the things of the Lord. That's what God wants. He's going to bring that forth in our life, praise God. That's why we've got to be at work to deal with everything. Not just one area or two. Not just focus on one thing. God wants, it's the whole package, isn't it, in all areas of our life. Ezra 6, 21, the children of Israel, when they were come again out of captivity, we're going to come out of all captivity, the sin, the world, the flesh, demons, all this stuff. And all such as had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land. It had nothing to do with the filthiness of the heathen of the land. Separate yourself from the things of this world. To seek the Lord God of Israel. That's what we're going to do. We're going to come out of all that. We're going to seek the Lord. Over in Psalms 24, verse 1. The earth's the Lord's fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And he comes down here, verse 3, he says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? That's Mount Zion. That's the overcomer. Who will stand in his holy place? Ah, this is the guy that has dealt with all the problems in his life. He has clean hands. He's cleaned himself. He's got a pure heart. He's got the clean, his heart's been cleansed. He's got a heart that's right with God. He didn't lift up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully any of these things, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That's what we want. We want the blessing of the Lord. Therefore, God wants clean hands and a pure heart. He wants you dealing with everything that is not of the Lord and get rid of it out of your life. You've got some problem areas, you need to get the word on that. You need to get those scriptures before you. Start get, thinking on those scriptures, doing those scriptures, and get that so established in you. Take every thought captive. Get, set your will. Set the boundary. Be ready to deal with the temptations and the attacks. 
and also be casting out all the spirits that came in from that sin, get the positive in and get the negative out, so to speak, and guard yourself, and you'll come out of it. But if you don't, if you just sit around, well, maybe I'll try, not, I'll try my best the next time, and you'll be falling for sure. It takes the power of God to deal with the power of the enemy. You have to rise up and do things God's way. Ezekiel 36, 29 and Apollo. He says, I'll save you from all your uncleannesses. All means all. I don't care what you say. Well, this, uh, I don't know if I can get rid of this one. This seems like a big bondage. Don't listen to it. All the, all the enemies will fall. Goliath will fall. They're all, none of them can stand. All your uncleannesses. I'll call for the corn. We'll increase it. We'll lay no famine upon you. I'll multiply the fruit of the tree, the increase of the field. You'll receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. You'll remember, and then shall you remember your own evil ways, your doings that were not good. God will bring these things to you and show you this was wrong. So you have a godly sorrow that works repentance, so you'll deal with every area of your life. See, everything's going to come up to come out. You're not going to bury it and suppress it. <laughs> it's coming up to come out, everything. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations, so you come into a real godly sorrow. And you'll turn for it, turn away from it. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto thee. Be ashamed, confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. He's trying to get them to the place of coming to real repentance. See, I just want somebody to pray for me and get rid of my problem. Just cast the demons out so I feel better. <laughs> You're not going anywhere until you deal with the problems in your life. You gotta, yes, you need the deliverance, but you've got to deal with all the other things that are going on. You've got to deal with everything. Thus saith the Lord God on the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities. I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the waste shall be builded. All those things that seem like they're just not being built in my life, everything will start to be built because you've been cleansed. You can't build anything when you've got all the waste sitting in there. Remember Nehemiah, when they had all the rubbish, they couldn't build the wall until they got the rubbish out. You're not going to be able to build the things of God in your life. You're going to get the word and you'll get you the truth so you can come to repentance and get right. But you're never going to see this building come as long as you've got all this iniquities in you. You've got to get cleansed of it. And then you're going to dwell on the cities. You're going to, the waste are going to be builded. The desolate land will be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. They shall say, this land that was desolate now become like the Garden of Eden. That's what you're to become like. Fruitful. Trees of righteousness. Fruits after fruit. A tree of life. Fruits coming out of you every which way. The waste and the desert, the ruined cities have become fenced or inhabited. Everything is going to be stopped from the enemies coming in. The fence is up, see. Then the heathen left that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places. You got some ruined places? They aren't going to stay ruined. You just get in and start doing what God says. He's going to eliminate it all. He's going to turn it all around. He's going to build the ruined places. He's going to restore you in all areas. And plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. You've got to get confident. Whatever God says, not just a bunch of words to just kind of make you get all pumped up and excited for a moment. No, you've got to know. God said he'll do it. It means if I do what he says, he'll do it in my life. We've got to get serious and be cleansed of all filthiness. You're going to be holy before the Lord. God's called you to be holy. Every bit of filthiness has to be run out of your life. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you that you are my holiness and you want me to be sanctified spirit, soul, and body. You said faithful is he who has called me. You've called me to be holy. You said you would do it. I understand. All this filthiness that's come into me has to be driven out. Man is drunk on righteousness like water. All this uncleanness and filthiness has come in from inheritance, my own sins, and victimization. It's polluted me. I am going to come in line with the Word of God and be obedient and trust in you and not do iniquity. Receive your correction. Deal with all the sin areas. Crucify the flesh daily. Repent 
of every uncleanness. Walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Get, change my garments. Put on the garments of God. Get rid of every evil thing. And be cleansed of all the hidden, secret things that only God knows about. I will cleanse my way because I will take heed to the Word of God. And I will go inside and I, every, on every filthiness that I find, I'm carrying it out. I'm eliminating it from the holy place. I will walk in the way of holiness. I will put on strength. I will put on the beautiful garments. I set the boundary. No more uncleanness is coming into me. I will not touch the unclean thing because I bear the vessel of the Lord, the presence of God that is to manifest in my life. I will walk in the spirit, never walk in the flesh. I will put off the old man. I will put on that new man. I will not allow fornication, lust, lasciviousness, any of these works of the flesh in my life again. So I don't get to the place of having no inheritance. I will govern my body and my soul. I will purify it, sanctify myself by doing what the Word says. I will cast out all the evil spirits as I get rid of and cleanse myself of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, casting out all the demons. I will perfect holiness in the fear of God. All filthy garments, they're coming away from me. They're being thrown out of me. And a change of raiment is coming into me through the word of God. I'm coming out of captivity. I separate myself from all that's not of God. I seek the Lord. And as I have clean hands, I'll get stronger and stronger. As I have clean hands and a pure heart, I will dwell in the holy hill, having conquered the enemies. And the Lord will save me from all uncleanness. And he will rebuild and prosper and bless all areas of my life. Everything that's been waste is going to be eliminated. And God's going to rebuild it all. He's going to restore all areas. He will heal me. He will deliver me. He will set me free. I thank you, Lord. I am going to do what you say. I will cleanse myself of all filthiness in all areas of my life. And I will see the covenant of holiness performed in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. A very important message. All these ones on righteousness were important. These ones on holiness are just as equally important because we've got to be holy before the Lord. Father, I thank you and praise you for your word. Thank you for speaking to every single one. Thank you for this word written in our hearts and minds. Thank you that we're taking hold of it and we're going to be doers of the word. And we're going to be aggressive in cleansing ourselves from all the filthiness so that we will be holy vessels before you. And we thank you as we, we do what you say, you're going to rebuild everything and restore everything in every area of our life. Father, thank you for performing your word as we are hearers and doers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We're not done on this yet. We got